All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us as we continue the 2020-2021 uh, Lectures in Mathematics Education series. Uh, the second installment in the series will be led by Dr. Beth Herbel Eisenman and her co-speakers Lori Busby and Dean Hanton, all joining us from East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, the, lecture the Lectures in Mathematics Education series is sponsored by the Herman and Rache Math Initiative and the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Education, with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education, including Dr. Herbal Eisenman, Ms. Busby, Busby, and Mr. Hanton. We have a great group contributing to this lecture series, and many of the lectures like this one will feature co-presenters who can speak to the impact and or their engagement in the research that's being discussed from a school's or teacher's based perspective. We're thankful to be able to provide access to the series virtually and for our guest speakers and everyone joining us for working in this new digital world. Today, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Herbal Eisenman, Ms. Busby, and Mr. Hanton, who will be giving a talk titled, Putting Positioning to Work Towards Powerful Mathematics Classroom Discourse. A former junior high, high excuse me, a former junior high mathematics teacher, Dr. Beth Herbal Eisenman is currently a professor of mathematics education at Michigan State University and is on assignment as a program officer at the National Science Foundation. Her work draws on ideas from sociolinguistics and discourse literatures to research written curriculum and classroom discourse practices, as well as the professional development of secondary mathematics teachers. Within this broader work, she is especially interested in issues of equity that concern authority, positioning, and voice in mathematics classrooms and professional development. Her work has been published in national and international journals, including the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education, Educational Studies in Mathematics, Teaching and Teacher Education, Teachers College Record, and Mathematics Teaching in the Middle School. And she has co-edited three research volumes focused on curriculum, equity, and discourse. Additionally, most of our academic career is focused on working in collaboration with secondary mathematics teachers who have used action research to become more purposeful about their discourse practices and better support students' opportunities to learn. She describes these long-term relationships as being extremely influential through her practice as a mathematics teacher educator and informing her design work, co-authoring professional development materials titled Mathematics Discourse in Secondary Classrooms, a practice-based multimedia resource for professional learning. Dr. Herbal Eisenman and her teacher collaborators present findings from their work together at professional conferences and in writing. Beyond her research and collaborations, she has also been committed to serving the broader mathematics education community. She was on the editor editorial board for JRME, chaired NCTM's research committee, and with regards to AMT, served as a board member and co-chaired the equity task force. She also currently serves on the international advisory board and is the acting convener for mathematics education and society, and serves as a mentor for the STAR mentoring program, service teaching and research, supporting first and second year mathematics education faculty from around the United States. Joining Dr. Beth Herbal Eisenman is Lori Busby and Dean Hanton, both secondary mathematics teachers in East Lansing Public Schools and research collaborators. Since 2012, Beth, Lori, and Dean have worked together in partnerships focused on doing action research to become more purposeful about facilitating mathematics classroom discourse that is productive and powerful for student learning. Their partnership began with a pilot of the previously mentioned professional development materials for mathematics discourse in secondary classrooms, which Beth was co-designing with colleagues. Today, these two teacher researchers will share some of the ways in which positioning theory has contributed to changes in their practice and how they think about their interactions with students. Both Lori and Dean have taught for more than 30 years, with Lori having taught both high school and middle school mathematics, and Dean having taught middle school mathematics and English. Over the years, in addition to, in addition to Lori and Dean, the research partnership has involved a total of 12 mathematics teacher researchers from the same school district. One of Beth's former colleagues, Dr. Uh, Sa, and three doctoral students, so far, this collaboration has resulted in five presentations at regional and state NCTM conferences, an, art, an article in research mathematics education, and a book chapter in NCTM's Access and Equity, promoting high quality mathematics, grades six through eight, and an article in mathematics teaching in the middle school. After the talk, we will finish, uh, after we finish the talk, we'll have time for questions. And when that time comes, we ask that you post questions in the chat box 
and we will get to as many as we can. For the talk, you can make sure you're in speaker view and please mute your microphone during the presentation. Thank you again for joining us and I'll turn it over to Dr. Herbal Eisenman. Hi, everybody. Um, we hope you're healthy and safe in these difficult times, and we appreciate you all joining us today to listen to us talk about our partnership work. Before we do that, a few acknowledgements and gratitudes. We'd like to thank Michael Lawson for his amazing support getting ready for the presentation. We'd also like to thank the School of Education for the invitation to share our work and the Herman and Roche Bath Initiative for funding this series. Finally, we want to recognize and acknowledge and express gratitude to the fact that the work that we're going to share today is not our own individual work. Rather, um, it's been ongoing work for quite a long time and has involved many colleagues, many other teachers, um, and has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the Create for STEM Institute. Um, we are going to be using Padlet today, so if you have a device available to get onto Padlet later to post things, that would be great. So um, a quick overview of what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to give a little bit of background, a little bit about my stance as a teacher, educator, researcher, the partner and the kind of partnership and the tools and ideas that we are working with in the partnership. Dean and Lori will each offer an example that illustrates how we've put the idea of positioning to work in our partnership. And then I'm gonna end the talk by um, arguing why action research needs to be used more in the professional development of teachers. And throughout the talk, what I hope is that you can see how the teachers highlight in their action research work actually relates to countering the deprofessionalization of teachers and to humanizing students. So my stance as a teacher education, teacher educator researcher, really the motivations from my work come from at least three places. First, in resistance to my and most teachers experiences with typical professional development as somebody who previously taught junior high math, uh, my experience of typical professional development and what I've seen happen in the six, five different states that I've lived in and in Canada as someone other than teachers decide what the focus will be and who will come in. Typically the decisions relate to policies that have been adopted in the state or district. Typically it involves short-term workshops or presentations that focus on telling or showing teachers what to do. The values and purposes are determined ahead of time with little contextual knowledge of the place the professional development is happening. And teachers have very little agency in the process. A second motivation for my work um, happened when I went to graduate school and started um, hearing how teachers were typically positioned in research. Oftentimes they are framed as the object of researchers investigations and then ultimately are expected to be consumers and implementers of findings. And the third one is in honor of the partnership teachers that I've worked with. I've learned a lot from being in classrooms and talking with teachers. Although I've done theoretical work in my research, I'm actually a lot more interested in how those ideas might matter to teachers and students in classrooms. I think we have to put ideas from theory to work to see how teachers and students make sense of them, not just study what they think or know, but to understand what ideas are compelling enough to teachers to make changes in their practice, toward better experiences for and with students, and then to use what we learn from teachers and students to talk back to and develop theories and ideas. I don't think of research and practice as disjoint ways of knowing. I think they need to be in conversation with each other. So just in case um, people aren't familiar with action research, this is a quick overview of the characteristics of action research. It's embedded within a teacher's practice or school. It requires systematic data collection and reflection, which you'll see a bit of um, in Dean and Lori's presentations. It sees students' perspectives as central and it occurs in collaboration. In fact, it assumes that teachers, perhaps more than any other stakeholders, are in a position to give evidence-based suggestions to improve schooling. It's not a one-time event, but it's a continuous process to work toward better learning environments. The other aspect that we found important 
is that action research actually in the participation of working together pursues practical solutions and more generally toward the flourishing of individual people and their communities. And you'll see a bit more about that as we go through our presentation. So as Michael um, mentioned in the introduction, our partnership began in 2012 with a pilot of some professional development mater materials that we were designing. It's involved, I went back and counted, it's actually 13 different teacher researchers, anywhere from four to nine people at a time. Um, Dr. Neeral Shaw, who's now at the University of Washington, and three graduate students. And over time, since we've been working together, the particular focus has changed and developed, but it's always centered on improving students' opportunities to participate and learn. So the tools and ideas that we work from are ideas from sociolinguistics and social psychology. Um, and they're based in a set of professional development materials that we developed that actually came from a previous partnership. So it uses all these different artifacts of practice to then engage secondary mathematics teachers in thinking about mathematics classroom discourse. And we don't use the term discourse in a colloquial way to mean discussion. We mean anything people do to communicate with one another, including speaking, writing, drawing symbols or other representations, gesturing and other nonverbal communication and so on. The overarching goal is for teachers to become more purposeful about their classroom discourse practices so that they are productive. What we talk about is productive and powerful for students' opportunities to learn. When we talk about productive, we focus on the ways in which classroom discourse practices can support students' access to mathematical content and discourse practices. So this is one of the ways that we can promote students' facility with, the, with mathematical discourse practices, but also that they're powerful. Anytime we interact with students, we're, we're sending them messages about what it means to know and do mathematics and who they are in relationship to knowing and doing mathematics. So the tools that we offer, and there's a handout in the Google folder that also gives a brief description of these. Um, we talk about teacher discourse moves and the teacher discourse moves are a set of moves that probably a lot of you have heard about, but we offer them as alternative moves to use in place of the pervasive teacher initiates, student respond, teacher gives feedback or evaluate, and then that pattern goes over and over again. Everyone is social, socialized into discourse practices and it takes a lot of work to step outside of how we've been socialized. This is particularly true for teachers because it's the only profession that we learn to participate in as students for 16 years before we teach. And for math teachers who get little or no information about discourse or language or communication in their teacher preparation program, falling back on the lecture in IRE or IRF tends to be um, common. So um, inviting student participation, waiting, or it's been called wait time sometimes, probing a student's thinking, revoicing, asking students to revoice, and creating opportunities for people to engage with another's reasoning. What we've found actually is that most teachers probably use at least four of these, but the thing is, is that they don't realize that they're using them and or they're not intentional about when, how, and why they use them. So when we offered these um, teacher discourse moves to a previous partnership, one of the questions they asked us is how do we know what's happening, like whether it's good or bad or how to interpret what's happening. So we decided to add a couple of different um, conceptual lenses for teachers to use to interpret what's happening. And I'm not going to talk as much about the ones that we use for productive today because we really want to highlight the idea of positioning because it relates to powerful discourse. So the idea of positioning is central to our systematic investigation of classroom discourse. So positioning is the ways that we use words and actions that send messages to students about who they are as learners, what they're capable of, what mathematics is, what it means to know and do math and so on. And we argue that students need to see themselves as people who can know, do and understand mathematics. Positioning um, people can position themselves or they can be positioned by others. So for example, um, I'm sure many people, if you've taught mathematics, have had parents come into the room and say, 
oh, I could never do mathematics. So right there, they've positioned themselves in a particular way in relationship to the content. Positioning happens all the time. It's not something we can get rid of, just like ideas like power and control. Um, oftentimes when we start working on these ideas with teachers, the, the initial response is that they want positioning not to happen, but that's not actually something that can happen because it occurs all the time. What we have to do instead is to become more intentional about what we do when we're positioning ourselves and others. So it's not necessarily intentional. And for us, one of the most important things about positioning is that it supports and has consequences for the development of students' dispositions and identities. So if students are positioned consistently over time in a particular way, those positionings are more likely to become enduring um, aspects of their identities. So teachers have to think of themselves as people who contributed to students' identity development as we interact with them. Um, there's an, um, when we operationalize this for teachers, we use it as a reflective lens. We think about how positioning of people happens and the positioning of mathematics. So in the positioning of people, the teachers think about when they interact with students, that there's always issues of authority and agency. There's issues about opening up participation so students can bring their ideas to the table. We talk about considering biases, assigning competence, and letting students do the intellectual work instead of the teachers doing the intellectual work. But positioning also happens when students interact with one another. They're also playing out issues of status and bias when they interact with one another and they play off of who they think is smart. And we draw on some of the work on complex instruction um, in our articulation of, of positioning of students when they interact. But alongside that, we're also positioning mathematics as a particular way of knowing, doing, and understanding. All of the activities, tasks, and questions that we give send messages to students about what it means to know, do, and understand mathematics. So I wanna say just a teeny bit more about considering biases because Dean is gonna be talking about this in just a little bit. So we think about implicit bias, it's again unconscious and typically unintentional, but it's the attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So in whole class discussions, for example, a teacher's implicit bias can inadvertently privilege the participation of some students over others. And this can prevent all students, especially girls and students of color from accessing the participation opportunities needed for learning. There's little evidence that teachers are consciously producing these kinds of racial and gender inequities. In fact, teachers are some of the best intentioned people we have in society, and yet none of us are immune to the influence of implicit bias. And we found our collaborations that mathematics, need a, that mathematics teachers need a systematic way of identifying implicit biases in their classroom discourse practices. So this is just an example of some of the kinds of positioning questions that we reflect on throughout our looking at um, classroom videos. Who's considered smart in the interactions and about what? Who's considered a struggling learner? How do students work together? Um, this set of positioning questions is also in a document in the Google folder and we'll be using this in just a little bit to look at one of Lori's examples of her classroom. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Lori um, and Dean. Lori's gonna highlight our early work and how using the teacher discourse moves in intentional ways have helped her see students in different ways and then allowed her to be to more consciously work to position students as intellectual contributors. Dean's gonna highlight some more recent work and um, talk a little bit about how we became more concerned with who was getting various kinds of opportunities to participate and begin to investigate implicit bias in systematic ways. So, Lori. Good afternoon. Um, as was stated earlier, um, I've just begun my 36th year of teaching. Um, I began my career teaching high school mathematics for 14 years, and then in subsequent years, I've been at McDonald Middle School teaching eighth grade math and algebra one. But before beginning this work with Beth, Beth, I was the traditional teacher. I, my model was IRE all the way. I, it was all about control. The instruction that students got was 
very much skill-based. They gain access to mathematics concepts through my instruction. I wanted to control everything in every way and student responses were short and right answer directed. So shortly we'll be looking at a video recorded two years into our participation together in action research around how using the teacher discourse moves allowed me to support students in articulating their thinking. The context for this video is um, my second hour eighth grade math class. There were about 22 students and we were focusing our conversations on linear relationships. So if we were face to face, we would talk about this together, but because we are virtual, please refer to the two handouts in the Google folder. Um, we'll use Padlet as you watch the video to post your responses to the questions. The first being, where in the lesson do you see me using the teacher discourse moves? And the second one, what do you see in relationship to positioning of students and mathematics? Looking through the Padlet responses will prove interesting, I'm sure. So, At the beginning of the session, when you came in, this task was shared with you. This is the task that the students are working on um, and discussing. And I think Michael was gonna post the Padlet in chat so people can link to it easily. All right, so volunteer to come up and circle one group that you had, just one. Well, um, I wasn't a hundred percent sure if I did my uh, my equations correctly, but I tried to do them, and then when I seen the measurements, um. I tried to find a graph that matched those measurements, and A seemed to match the measurements to me. Okay. So I just want to show your paper. When you say measurements, what do you mean? Like the equations like X and Y, uh, I thought that they matched A. So what did you do with these things right here? Uh, with the equations? I mean, I was just curious, oh, okay. You took this and you made ordered pairs from the tables. Mm -hmm. And so what did you do with the ordered pairs? Um, I, I looked at them and then I looked at the graph to see if the measurements like on the graph matched uh, the ordered pairs. Okay. I don't really know how to explain it. Okay, I think that gives us an idea. So Chris. No. Why did you choose C, F, and J to go together? Well, first I had the C and J because um, the equation I made it was a negative, so I made the graph go <coughs> down. What do you mean the equation made it negative? The coefficient made, um, well, the coefficient in the equation is negative, <coughs> which makes the graph go down. Yeah, and then the tables, that was the last one on there, so I just said Oh, so by process of elimination, this yeah. was what you had left over, so you chose that table? Okay. Comments about this. Are these the same groups that you grouped? What about the table or the graph or the equation makes you agree or disagree with the groups up here? So I, I'm going to need you to look up here and see what you think about their choices. Fletcher. Uh, I realize uh, that I made a mistake on one of these. Which one? Um, I drew, I grouped uh, A, E, and G, but looking back on it, I see that I should have grouped uh, A, E, and H. Because? Uh, the equation for G didn't go with the E graph. How didn't it go with the E graph? Um, half of... The E table or the... Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. E table. Okay. Um, 0.5 times negative 2 is negative 1, minus 3 is negative 4, 0.5 times 1 is 0.5 minus 3 is negative 3.5, so 
so if you drop down okay. area, that's going to be a mistake. Okay. Liliana? Well, I chose to grab, to grab graph A with table B with equation G because um, when I was looking at the coefficients and constant, it, I thought that it matched with the um, intersection of A. And when I plugged in the x value in table B, I got the same value. Okay, so you plug these values in here and you got the very same y values? I did um, the first two um, x values now and then I thought, well, if the two first two are matching up with equation G, so I'm going to choose table B to go in. Okay, so that's what I've got. Okay, so you have... If I have a different color, you said A, D, and G? Yes. Okay. Tyler, what do you think? Well, I was just going to say another reason why Chris is, um, is right, I think, is because you said that it falls um, to the right because negative 2, but it also, they also, um, it also means that positive 3. Okay, so how many of us agree with the green group? All right, so we're okay with this group. All right, thanks, Tyler. What about the red and the blue? We have to fix this. We're not sure. Liliana has an idea. Darvell has an idea. Jared had an idea. Deja, what do you think? I think AEH is right because as you see the graph, it it has to be it has to have positive. And so for B for equation H being matched up with B, that would be wrong because you have to because two is positive, so the coefficient you would have the line starting from in the positive falling to the left. So you're saying that this should be falling to the left? No, <coughs> that's in the right. That's rising right. Uh -huh. But with <coughs> negative three, it would fall to the left. Ben? Um, I agree with her because uh, when you look at uh, graph A and on uh, table E, uh, one of the coordinates is one negative one, and when you graph that on graph A, it shows up on there. Oh. Okay, so what do you guys think? All right, so volunteer. Okay, so um, some of the teacher discourse moves that you may have observed in the video, there was probing where our students would explain and justify and clarify their thinking. There was inviting. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree? Even some examples of where students are creating without me even asking them to. And with regard to positioning, you may have noticed students consider each other's thinking, work on ideas together, build on the thinking of others, politely agree and disagree with each other, students sharing their important ideas, seeming to feel safe and, sh and sharing mistakes, which we know allows for opportunities to create deeper and more meaningful understandings. Students demonstrate the value of reasoning and justifying, not just getting the right answer. And students can make connections between multiple representations of mathematical ideas and see the importance in doing so. So early in our work at the time of this recording, these were the things that I was very focused on, really getting student voices out there and having them interact with each other, watching this video makes me at this time realize that I had so much more to do. Um, each year in my action research, I continue to think about how I could be intentional about shifting my practice to support students in seeing themselves as productive and powerful thinkers and doers of mathematics. 
But because of this work and the resulting changes in my practice, I hope to continue learning and doing this. Our partnership with Beth and the work we've done has afforded me more professional growth than any other professional development that I have encountered. And I have participated in some good professional development. This has helped me stay excited and motivated and feel like I have so much more to learn and so much more to do. Thank you, Lori. So this earlier work that Lori described didn't just impact classroom practices. The teacher researchers advocated for providing high quality opportunities to learn at the school level too. They adopted new curriculum materials that provided consistent high cognitive demand tasks for students and they detracted sixth and seventh grades and decided to allow students to opt into eighth grade algebra. But they also continued to reflect on and study other problems that came up. Once the teacher researchers worked on opening up their classroom spaces where many students were participating, they then been, began to wonder whether they were actually giving all their students high quality opportunities to participate. For instance, we knew from studies of classroom discourse have shown that boys receive a disproportionate greater number of high level questions compared with girls and other studies have found similar patterns with respect to race where black students are often relegated to lower level aspects of mathematical tasks. They realized that to consider this, they needed to better understand how implicit bias might be influencing what was happening. They didn't want to be part of the problem of contributing to the marginalization of students. They wanted to be part of the solution to countering the kinds of opportunities students get, which Dean is going to talk about now. Good afternoon, thanks for joining us here. Um, as one of my colleagues highlighted in a presentation at an NCTM conference, making the claim that discourse is working in my classroom requires evidence. Videotaping your practice is the key to understanding these issues. What you feel is happening may not be what's really happening in your classroom. The evidence requires looking at who gets what kinds of opportunities to participate. So much like Lori, I've been teaching a long time. Um, my original kind of early practice was much like hers. Uh, I provided a lot of information. I got a lot of right answers. I got a lot of answers that I was looking for, right? I knew what I was trying to get at. And so this is kind of the first before. Um, as I've gone through this research, I, I think that I've discovered that there's a lot of befores. It's a series of improving. And so this first before is just IRE based. I'm up there being the sage on the stage and we need to get away from that. So we put in a whole bunch of rich tasks. Um, I, I worked on these TDMs, I opened up my classroom. There was a marked increase in both the amount and types of participation across student groups, a commensurate decrease in those IRE interactions. So success, right? However, there were still students who participated less and in noticeably different ways than their peers. So I started to wonder if all students were having the same opportunities to participate and if my teaching was the cause of any of those differences. So this becomes my before number two. I did a lot of equality work, right? I called on boys and girls proportionally. I used random calling, I used cooperative groups. We did a lot of things to make things equal in my classroom. And before beginning this, this work on TDMs, I, I wasn't too worried about all these things, right? It was just part of teaching. Now I felt pretty good about my practice. The TDMs, the discourse had made a huge difference. And through the use of good tasks and those moves, I'd increased participation in student success. My classroom was more student-centered, but there were still students struggling and some who were not participating much at all. The fact that our school showed a large gap in performance between our white minority students was extremely problematic. And I knew that they were just as capable of participating and succeeding in these discussions. So we began to talk about additional reasons why they may not be participating in the same ways. Several of my colleagues and I decided to look at our practice to see how we may have unintentionally been contributing to the issue. We decided to think not just about who participates, but how and under what conditions. So now we're starting to think about equity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are some of the actions that we thought could help us create more equitable whole, dis whole class discussions. For instance, purposely asking more minoritized students to participate seems like a bit of a no-brainer, but the nature of those interactions was important as well. What types of participation were we encouraging? Designing open-ended questions where multiple answers are possible was one avenue to creating opportunities for minoritized students to engage. But first, we really needed to know what was actually happening, not what we thought was happening, but what was actually happening during whole class discussions 
So we needed a tool to help us analyze those interactions. And this is where EQIP comes in. Um, as Beth mentioned, we were working with Dr. Neeral Shah, who was then at MSU and is now at U of W. And he has this web-based tool called EQIP. And EQIP allows us to choose what dimensions of classroom discourse we're actually gonna look at. So he was able to push us and help us investigate the patterns of participation in our classroom compared to both social markers that we had assigned to students and then identify patterns of implicit bias. So, EQIP allows us to choose the dimensions of classroom discourse and the social markers that we wanna code. We chose whole class discussions as compared to student gender and race. It's important to note that since we were looking for implicit bias and ways to forestall it, I coded my perception of each student's gender and race. Our collective focus has been mainly on girls and non-Asian students of color because research shows that these groups have been persistently marginalized through policies, practices, and other opportunities to learn in mathematics education. In our videotape lessons, we hated videotaping our lessons, but we did it anyway. We marked the type of question being asked as well as the type and length of each student's response. Equip is then able to create graphs for analytic discussion. And here for illustrative purposes, I'll share what the analytics look like when we focused on teacher questions. This is a graph that shows gender distribution of questions in a class that had 11 girls and 19 boys. Females are represented here by the green bars and boys by those pink bars. On the y-axis is what we call the equity ratio, and that compares the actual participation to expected participation based on those classroom demographics. An equity ratio of exactly one represents a proportional or equal share of a particular discourse opportunity. For example, girls in this class represented 37% of students, so an equity ratio of one would mean they received 37% of discourse opportunities. But take a look at that second set of bars, the how questions. That data shows that 52% of all how questions went to girls, and that resulted in an equity ratio of approximately 1.4. Some of the researchers in our group thought that they would strive for an equity ratio of one or equality for every demographic group. I argue that equity ratios greater than one are desirable for girls and black students, for example, in light of their histories of marginalization in mathematics education. Therefore, I felt really good about this graph. Knowing that females are often minoritized in math and science, I set out to over-include them in whole class discussions and was apparently successful. When it comes to race, however, the results were less congratulatory. I know this graph is hard to read on your screens, but if you look at the pink bars across each one of those types of questions, those are our white students, and they receive a near proportional share of most question types, while black students, which are the orange bars, if you look down close to zero, you'll find those, received disproportionately fewer why, how, and what questions. This was disappointing, but not unexpected based on the research we've been discussing in our action research group. The question then becomes, what do I do to mitigate this? How can I increase the opportunities for minority students and especially black students to participate? Given the complex nature of equity issues in classroom discourse, we expected EQIP to reveal this kind of variation. Indeed, the mix of more equitable and less equitable results points to the need to examine our questioning patterns, even for experienced reflective teachers that are dedicated to equity work. So what did we do? Well, we met as a group once a month to examine our data, discuss key issues, and most importantly, develop action plans. We also realized that quantitative data do not speak for themselves. Rather, they are intended to provide information about broader patterns over time for deep reflection. Context matters. Does our opinion of the graph on the previous slide change if we know that there were only two Latinx students in the class, one of whom participated at every single opportunity and often when he wasn't invited? As teachers, we need to make sense of such analytics in relation to our teaching practice, our professional knowledge of our students, and our students' prior educational experiences as members of particular social identity groups. We then used our reflections to implement our action plans. So in my classroom, I began trying several different approaches to make changes in participation patterns. These are some of the strategies that saw positive results in terms of promoting the voices of students who are trying to better support. Some of these strategies encourage more participation from students more generally, but intentionally target students who have had fewer opportunities to participate or have just not been required to participate in high quality ways, such as not being asked to justify their thinking or only giving one word responses. As we have said, what we think is happening is not always what actually happens in retrospect. I had the best of intentions, but if I didn't explicitly plan for specific student participation, it often did not happen of its own accord. 
So I found that highlighting places and lesson plans with the names of specific students I wanted to participate was particularly helpful. I used bright sticky notes and I kept that on a plan right on a clipboard that I carried with me in the classroom. Students show, that show confidence in other classes often have been systemically put on the sidelines in math education. I would use conversations with individual students outside of class or utilize strategies during class to reinforce for them that their peers would benefit from hearing their ideas. We knew that these students were capable math thinkers and doers, but they had to come to that understanding as well. For one quick anecdote, in one circumstance, I had a black student whose name was Dawson, and he did not want to share in class. In this particular situation, he refused to share out his idea, but he was okay if I shared it for him. The class was impressed. It was an area model that no other student had tried to, to use. And another student was so impressed that he declared we had Dawsonified the problem. It didn't end there. As a class, we took up that phrase, me included, and whenever we used his process, we called it Dawsonifying. He had a friend that was a year younger. It lasted through an entire another class year. We Dawsonify those problems. The seating chart was another area with interesting results. My room was set up with eight groups of four packed into a not large space. I reasoned that the tables closest to the board would be the ones to participate most. By watching and coding my videos using Equip, I realized that I more frequently called on students who sit towards the middle of the classroom from back to front, rather than students around the perimeter. So I temporarily moved students I had not called on into the center seats, and students who were called on frequently out to the perimeter of the classroom. Changing those seating charts frequently, and then observing how this impacted students' participation, helped distribute my students' opportunities to participate. We saw lasting impacts of these moves. The students who were moved to the middle of the classroom continued to participate later, even when I moved them back to other parts of the classroom. Now, the success of each of those strategies was rooted in intentionality. In a classroom of 30 plus student te students, teachers make too many decisions every second to consider each nuance. We rely on instinct and unconscious programming and implicit bias flourishes. The commitment to investigate and change my practice, the blessings of my colleagues that under, willingly undertook this journey with me, and the gift of partners that supported and pushed me were not alone enough to enact change in my classroom. I needed to be data-driven, I needed an action plan, I needed to be purposeful in my approach, and I needed to be intentional in my implementation. With that, I'll throw it back to Beth for some final comments. So I wanna thank Gloria and Dean for sharing these examples that illustrate some important ways we've put positioning to work in our partnership. I've learned and continue to learn from and with them and I'm thankful for their dedication to the profession and the youth with whom they work. What I'd like to do now is shift the lens just a bit to talk about putting positioning to work in relationship to the positioning of teachers and how action research is something more math teachers need to be doing because I believe it contributes to their professionalization. In the mid 90s, Tom Popkowitz problematizes aspects of professionalization, but he um, offers this definition of a professional. Just like students, teachers are always in the process of becoming who they are and are being positioned and positioning themselves. I hope you can see the way that these teacher researchers are becoming more competent, specialized and have expressed their dedication toward the, serving the public trust. In particular, the ways they think hard about positioning students as intellectual contributors and, in, and reflect on implicit bias have shifted the ways they humanize students and more intentionally support their positive dispositions and identity development. This is the way we need to see and position teachers as people who are highly competent, specialized and dedicated as people who can identify problems of practice, carefully and systematically consider data from their classrooms and make changes to better support students' opportunities to learn. As I mentioned in the opening of one of my motivations for doing the work is that I oppose typical professional development teachers get. In my first long-term collaboration, one of the teacher researchers said this about being part of an action research partnership. We're just never, ever, ever, ever treated with autonomy or to think that what we think would be best or to think about what's important and do it for a long time or to be supported in what you think is best over a long time. That structure in this project was so foreign. This kind of experience, not being treated with autonomy, being treated as if you don't know what's best, that you're not supported undermines teachers and teaching as a profession. In fact, if we examine the kinds of assumptions embedded in typical professional development practice, we see things like someone other than teachers know what teachers need to do and know, 
everyone needs to do the same thing because they all attend the same PD session. Context is not important. Teaching is fairly simple because it can be broken down into things one does. Teachers only need to follow someone else's suggestion to teach better. And the process of enacting those suggestions is so simple that no follow-up is needed. These all contribute to the deprofessionalization of teachers. And when we consider them within other pervasive societal discourses in the US, things like the overemphasis on narrow measures of student learning, the overregulation and monitoring of teachers and curriculum by policymakers and administrators, media and public discourse about the failures of public schools, we can see how the deprofessionalization of teaching is amplified by these broader messages too. So I wanna argue that it's our ethical obligation to, to consider alternative perspectives and learning opportunities for teachers. Although we talk to teachers about advocating for youth, we have to consider who has the power to advocate for teachers. In this current context, we need to commit to letting policymakers and PD decision makers know and understand that the typical model of PD is not healthy, nor does it in many instances support teachers to get better at working with youth. We're all part of the system and we can choose to humanize or dehumanize people in our work. That said, I'm not suggesting that we need to keep loading the work on for teachers. I think administrators, policymakers, teacher leaders need to make changes to make such work sustaining and rewarding for teacher researchers. As Cochrane, Smith and Lytle proposed, and this is all the way back in 1990, we have to consider new and different ways of um, supporting teachers. It may be things like incentives, it could be things like reforming organizational patterns and considering the kind of hierarchical power relationships that exist. Is it possible, for example, to create supportive collaborative networks to allow teachers to visit each other's classrooms, to organize a venue for teacher researchers to share these, their findings. These things are a lot of work and would require rethinking some of what happens in education and in schools. It would actually require a concerted effort from parents, policymakers, administrators, and teachers. But I would argue that the effort would be worth it. And I hope you can see from the examples Lori and Dean provided why the effort would be worth it. So I wanna end this talk with a quote from another teacher research about why action research, because teachers' voices matter. If the goal of PD is to have an impact on teachers' practice, then teachers must be active in the process. That's the only way that it's actually gonna have an impact. Like you can go in and try to tell somebody what they're doing wrong or they should be doing this and this instead, but you're never gonna get anywhere that matters for the best interest of students. So at this time, we'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Um, and we'd like to take whatever questions may have come in the chat or that people might have at this point. Thank you, Dr. Beth Herbal, Herbal, Herbal Eisenman and uh, Lori Busby and Dean Hanton. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, share those in the chat box and we'll get to a couple here as we uh, have a few minutes left for today. It's gotten very dark here. <laughs> That's better. Like we left them all speechless. <laughs> or they're in deep thought. <laughs> so we have one question here from Morgan. Uh, can you talk about the differences in discourse across grade levels? How would these strategies work for teachers of younger kids? I mean, um, so we, I was going to say, We've had, we've had teachers who started in the middle school and then moved to the elementary school. And basically they've used the same sorts of moves and created similar sorts of norms in their classrooms. It's actually, um, I think she was teaching, was it fourth grade, Lori and Dean? Yes. Fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth. Yeah. Um, but these are very similar to what um, uh, Anderson, I'm like, oh my gosh, of course now I'm in a blank. 
the Talk Moves book. That one actually was developed using elementary classrooms and the teacher discourse moves, we started with their moves and then adapted them after watching a whole bunch of classroom videos from high, middle school and high school. So they're very similar. We have another question here from Marie. Uh, she's asking, what might be the right bite size to begin this work with teachers? Something small. The, the first several years we did this work, we continually told ourselves not to t bite off more than we could chew, and then we did anyway. And that's very frustrating to do more than you can. Pick something small and try to implement it and study what happens when you do. Um, find something, one of the, the discourse moves or something that you're curious about, and then do it and find out what happens when you do it. Keep some evidence of that in some format. Um, we had a teacher who took a, a, a class list and just marked every time a kid participated. And that was a simple beginning just for seeing how many kids were participating when she did one specific discourse move. So just something simple and straightforward and see how you can adapt it. I would agree with Dean. Um, when we first started, it's really easy to try to look at, especially when you first start looking at your videos for the first time, all of the things that you think that you need to work on. But we have, really made it a conscious practice of keeping it simple and not trying to work on too many things at once. A follow-up to this question is, do you start with the moves and then focus on positioning? Or do you kind of do those things together? So in the way that we set it up in the professional development materials is we actually set up the ideas about productive discourse. So um, something called the language spectrum, which considers how context, how kids talk differently about mathematics in small group versus whole class report out versus writing up a solution, which is also different from what a textbook might look like and ideas about the mathematics register and then we introduce the teacher discourse moves. And the first thing we ask teachers to do is watch a video of themselves and just identify where they're already using them, which is why we know a lot of them are already doing some of these. Um, and then we bring in positioning theory. And then it's, it's constantly revisiting those two things and picking up whatever the teachers are interested in talking about. Um, so it's sort of a combination of, the, of both. Dean, it is, but it's yeah, if you're, if you're trying to, if this is new and you've not considered discourse moves as an explicit kind of thing before, then it's really hard to try and do two things at once. Um, I think it's easier to start with the discourse moves if they're new and then try and think about how you're positioning students when you're doing that. But if you've done discourse oriented work before and you have an idea of what those look like and how you're using them, then you can think about positioning at the same time. It comes back to that don't bite off too much. Your next question is from Geraldine. Uh, I wonder if you might say more about how the team narrowed in on the part of discourse to investigate. So over the years that shifted and changed, the first year we actually did a group action research project. Um, there, we spent a lot of time trying to articulate what we thought a good explanation and justification was in a middle school math classroom and then thought about what would it look like in sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade. And the teacher started to develop strategies for supporting students to um, articulate their thinking in ways that they were required to write. So they would do things like put up a, a something a student said in a different class, oftentimes not the same class because then there's positioning things going on there that may or may not be what they want. And then saying, okay, what could we do with this explanation to make it a really precise explanation? So then they would work, it was almost like the writing process when you, um, which I think Dean had brought to the table having been a, a literacy teacher too. Um, and then the next year, each person picked their own individual research focus and they each sort of did their own thing. They would come in and they would tell everybody what they were focusing on. We kept Google Docs for them to write notes about their action research. And then they would just go off on their own for about an hour and watch their videotapes and do some of their analysis. And then we come back together and everybody shares out sort of some of the things that they're happy with that were happening and some of the things they wanted to trouble 
um, brainstorm, troubleshoot if there were things that weren't going as well as they had hoped. So it shifted and changed every year, but the end of the professional development materials, there's actually a capstone experience that helps support teachers to articulate their first research question and develop a plan for carrying that out. Dean and Lori, I don't know if you want to add. I, well, this, I think this is an easy place to jump in and say it's important to work with somebody else. Um, you mentioned, you know, troubleshooting and brainstorming some of these ideas. If I wouldn't have had people around me doing the same work, I would not have continued. It's, it's just too much to do and think about on your own. You're, if you're being reflective, you're finding ways to think about the issues that trouble you, but it's way easier to attack those issues and get good ideas if you're doing it with someone else. I was fortunate to have my entire middle school department doing it, but you really only need one other person. So if you can convince one other person to work with you and take on some of this work and do it together, um, maybe they can videotape you during their planning period and then you can talk about it, you know, at, at lunch for 20 minutes. I don't know. Um, but finding someone and some way to work with another person is a, a key thing there. Also, if you're someone who's reaching out to a school district to support other teachers um, and get them interested in their own action research. We, when we first started, we thought this is huge. We, we don't know if we have time for this. And we even had this discussion. Dean and I said, okay, this is year two. We're gonna meet with Beth, but I think this is a lot. I don't know if we can take it on. And we were not in coffee for five minutes and here we are agreeing to do it again because List, of the results. Yeah. Our, our to-do list was written, yeah. We had it scripted out. We were going to be like, oh, we don't know. This is this is really overwhelming. But they, we saw so much benefit in it. We couldn't say no. And the supports that she put in place, she really did a lot of work with our administration. She, We went to the board meetings together. She did what she could with some grant funding to really support us. And our colleagues in other disciplines are thinking, how are they getting to do all this? We want to do this too. So that's kind of on an, another end of the spectrum, but don't hold yourself back. Certainly if you can find one person that can work with you to do this, that's, a, that's wonderful. But the more you can do, the more powerful you're going to see this impacting what you do and your work with others. We see huge differences in our students. Language arts teachers will say, we were having this conversation today and I and the student had responded in this way and she said, wow, that was that was really great. And and the student said, well, this is what we do in math. This is how we interact in math. So it was just part of what they had learned to be as students. And we're getting comments from high school teachers in our own district as well over the last several years about how the kids are different during classroom discussions and discourse and how welcome that is at their level as well. So just to wrap up and kind of build off that, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here. Uh, so do you explicitly teach the students these linguistic tools and uh, to share their thinking? And to what extent do you bring the students in on this work uh, to become reflective about positioning in their discourse? I found it, um, I was 100% transparent with students. We wanted them to know that we were doing some work that could support a better experience for them. We knew they had great ideas. We wanted to see them interact with each other. We wanted them to see their own brilliance. We knew it was there. So we're learning, we're picking a focus class, and this is what we're doing. Here are some sentence stems. We had those laminated and put on student tables to help facilitate discussion just in response to something or in response to another student. Or we talked about the benefit of sharing um, mistakes. We looked at Joe Bowler's work as we set norms for our work together. Students took that and embraced it. It was amazing. And I even had one class one year that did most of the talking. I found that I was just on the side, just throwing things out there once in a while. Hasn't happened a lot, but that was an amazing class. And I can see the difference. And I'm, I have the pleasure of being the eighth grade teacher. So 
when we implement it in sixth grade, then seventh grade, then eighth grade, you can really, really see the difference in the, the discussions and even how students see themselves. I would agree with Lori. We've been very explicit, but we did not teach the discourse moves to students. What we did give them and try to teach them were, as she mentioned sentence sums, structures for those conversations that would support the discourse moves in different ways. So we did a lot of norm setting within the classroom about how are we going to participate in discussions and what kind of participation is powerful and helpful. But in terms of our research, I, I told them flat out what my focus was, um, even when I was working on implicit bias. And those were some uncomfortable conversations with a very diverse class um, coming from the old white guy in the room. Um, that was interesting, but I, I always told them flat out what I was looking at and I showed them the graphs and said, this is what I'm finding as I look at this. What, what do you think about this? What should we do about it? And tried to make them partners. I was going to say almost every time teachers came with an enduring um, dilemma or issue, we would say, have you asked the kids about this? And they're like, you know, every time you say that, I think, why didn't I think of that? And they go back and ask the kids and the kids help generate the solutions to the issues. It's not just the teachers making those, um, creating the solutions to some of the issues that are happening in the classroom. And we see much better buy-in too, because the kids have a voice in terms of what's happening around structures and processes and practices. All right, we have one more question if you have just a moment. Uh, what are your thoughts on flipping the classroom to allocate more of your time for small group or class-wide discussions? Did you all find that as something that was happening? So we haven't really done flipping the classroom, mostly because we use connected mathematics, which is um, uses the Launch Explore Summarize. And um, there may be some videos that the teachers have offered that might summarize some of the things from the lesson, not, but the, the definitely if they did the pre-teaching ahead of time, the launch and explore wouldn't, wouldn't be like fully the kids ideas. So we haven't done that so much. Um, Cause we're also trying to do high cognitive demand tasks and have kids interact with those together to come up to the conclusions. I can say because of the situation we're in, our district really wanted us to focus on the flipped classroom model, which I found to be problematic. And I had some concerns about the research around that. But we did think about um, the launch, explore, summary kinds of things. So my um, teaching partner, she, the other eighth grade teacher and our math teacher in our building, we would do videos of us performing the experiment as if we were in there with the students and that would be their pre-class work. So we might show the little video that, that was provided in the materials. Here's us doing the experiment. Hey, what do you think? And then those launch questions. So that's probably as close to the flip model as we have gotten, but it did get information to kids and they could start to think about the situation so we could come in and start the explore. But Laura, you're talking under a fully online model right now. Yes, yes. If you, if you were in person, you wouldn't be doing that same model. Oh. Right. All right, so we will take a moment just to say thank you to our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Beth herbal Eisman and uh, Dean Hanton and Lori Busby. And uh, thank you all for your time and for sharing your work with us. And uh, just to look ahead, we have our next speaker coming up actually next week on October 8th. You can believe it's October already. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have Dr. Miriam Sharon uh, come and join us for a talk next week. So if you have a chance to join us, that'd be great. Um, and as, as usual, we will have these, uh, this talk and all the following talks and previous talks posted on our YouTube channel. So if you don't have a chance to make all the notes that you were hoping to make and you wanna revisit some of those slides, you're more than welcome to. All right, thank you again to our speakers and we hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a good night. <laughs>